everyone. My name is Betsy O'Hagan, and I'm here representing uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society. And I'd like to welcome you to our meeting tonight. Uh, this is a hosted space courtesy of WCAS. And what we do is we divide the time into forums or presentations or conversations uh, for the first 30 minutes approximately. And then after that, we go and work uh, together on projects. Now, I want to uh, remind everyone that we have a rooms capability here on freeconferencecall.com. So if ever we want to break out into groups to discuss a project or a topic, we can do that. So we might do that um, in the future. But anyway, welcome, everyone. And um, uh, before we start, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about how Guardians of Nature came about. Uh, when WCIS hosted David Lindo for Urban Bird in Cleveland in November of 2019, we had several really interesting um, times. Uh, one, and many of them were, uh, several of them were for developing projects in community building and network strengthening. Um, and it was during one of those sessions that um, uh, David Lindo suggested the name for uh, for our networks to continue to carry out those discussions and the actions that they dreamt about. So uh, Guardians of Nature is really the name that David Lindo suggested for us. And we have kept it to carry on uh, and to imagine looking through the world um, through the lens of urban birding and that we are protectionists, we're protecting nature, we're preserving it, we're conserving it, uh, and we're part of it. So welcome, welcome to tonight. Tonight, we start with, and I'll go to the next slide, with Gloria Ferris, who is going to talk about Earth Day then and now. Um, and I don't know if you had a chance, if you subscribe to our emails, you would have um, had a chance to take a look at the video uh, that was produced, a short story uh, on Gloria's take on Earth Day then and now. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, turn, turn it over to Gloria, who is going to um, talk to us much more about Earth Day then and now. And by the way, happy Earth Day. <laughs> OK, Gloria. All right, I, I'm here. Hi, everybody. And uh, I think if you saw what we were going to do tonight, I kind of want to make this an interactive uh, session. And we've got quite a few people here, and we've got a, quite a few different ages. And I see we just had uh, a new a new person show up, Becky Robinson, and I want to thank her for coming. And uh, we've got some different age groups here. I think we have uh, some some of us who are going to be like me, who were there for that first Earth Day. And um, so what I'd like, for those of you who didn't look at the video or didn't read my story blog, um, I was at Bowling Green State University, and I was a junior there and that was in 1970 and a lot of things happened in 1970 and it wasn't all uh, about the uh, the uh, Earth Day and what we were doing there uh, with rivers burning and uh, Things were going pretty bad. Our cities had a lot of air pollution. The smog was just incredible here in Cleveland. And, uh, but we also had a lot of social unrest, uh, like we are kind of doing now. It's when we invaded Cambodia in the 1970s, and that's when uh, the Vietnam War started to uh, wind down because of the protests with that. And one of the things that I found interesting that day, and I want to know what your take is on what you think Earth Day does, and why do we need Earth Day, and and what does it mean to you? When did you uh, become active? Did you become active because you uh, 
we're part of Earth Days, and uh, where do you think we are now, and where would you like to go? The reason I want to talk about where would you like to go is because uh, we want to start a junior membership with programming, and we want to start it from birds. Who doesn't love birds? Who doesn't love watching birds? Uh, what child doesn't look and say, oh, mom, look at that beautiful red bird. What is that? And it's a northern cardinal. And we, we do that early on, and we need to, I believe, keep that wonder, childlike wonder about nature. And more and more we're hearing that people fear nature. They don't want to go out in the woods because they're afraid they'll meet a bear. Or they, you know, are afraid of the coyotes that have uh, kind of come back into our area because it's a good place to hunt uh, for food for their young ones and things like that. And how do we balance that so that nature becomes something that we want to protect and preserve like uh, Betsy said already. So if you don't remember all those questions, that's fine because if you don't uh, kind of step on them on your own, I'll, I'll give you a little prompt and ask you if that's not part of what you think about. So uh, Bruce, I kind of gave you a heads up on this. Uh, i like to know when you're first, uh, I know it's going to kind of say how old you are, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> you don't have to get specific about it. But when was your first uh, Earth Day, and what does it mean to you? Well, before we start with that, after this is done, all those people at PBS, Brother Thunberg will be on for three hours. Oh, what time? Starting at eight o'clock. Oh, so at okay. Eight, well, eight and 10. okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, let's start. Okay. I think it probably started about thirty some years ago when I made a lifestyle change and started believing in more natural products, getting chemicals out of the home, and just seeing what it did for me, that I started to be, get more appreciation for the environment. I always liked the environment. I always liked being in it. However, the uh, epiphany came about how everything is connected and how important nature is to everything. So, in your opinion, and this is your opinion, uh, how do you think we've done with chemical pollution in our lives? How well do you think we're doing, or are we really uh, failing? That's our biggest problem out there. Could you expound on that, why you think that? Because everything you buy in the grocery store and bring into your home to clean your house is either polluting your body, the house, or wherever you live, polluting all that environmental space, and then if you go outside and wash your cars using these products, the chemicals are all getting into the lawn, going down the sewer, and God knows where else is being traced to. So then it, it, it uh, fouls our air, it, it uh, ruins our water. Um, I, I saw the other day where someone said that because our water source is Lake Erie, 
we are better off than people whose water sources are uh, groundwater, underground water, like wells and uh, aquifers and things like that. What, what do you think? I mean, maybe you've never thought of that, but I thought that was kind of mm -hmm. like, eh, I think that's like just kind of putting it off and, and saying that, you know, we don't need to worry about it, but when we really do. No, I would agree with them about lake water being safer than groundwater because you have to remember Lake Erie is in a position where water is constantly flowing through it. So it's coming from the lakes on the west, coming through Lake Erie, going over the falls and out to the ocean. So I think Lake Erie is the only lake in the system that every, I forgot how many years, the total volume of the lake has been replaced by a new source of water. Oh, that's very interesting. That's something uh, that I didn't know. Uh, well, that's very interesting. I'm going to be interested in what Sean has to say uh, about Earth Day. But before I call on Sean, I think maybe I'll ask Drina, uh, when was your first Earth Day or his first experience with the Earth Day? Well, my first Earth Day was 1970 at Ohio State. State. <laughs> and it was a pretty big deal. Um, what comes back to me is also the theme of uh, population problems and um, the idea of zero population. Um, it was, there were a lot of people attended. Um, and then as you mentioned, there was unrest and then we were uh, with the Kent State shootings the next month, the National Guard came to uh, Columbus and we were sent home. Um, so I also remember that um, the zoology department at Ohio State was, was uh, seemed to be quite involved with that day, although that's just a, you know, kind of a fleeting thought. Um, I think the idea of population control um, was, has stayed with me, and also some other ideas like um, like uh, the problems we had in um, the United States with our automobiles and how so many of them were of poor, poor quality and were obsolete. So uh, at that time, um, I think I developed a sense of let's let's have let's purchase um, automobiles that are of higher quality and not going to be so wasteful. And um, I would say that I, I haven't been an activist in the way that I think that uh, you've been talking about it and it showed it in your videos, um, but it's of great concern, you know, and it's part of my um, a kind of philosophy of life to conserve and to appreciate nature. And I think we've seen tremendous, tremendous um, progress and you know in the Cleveland area uh, it the smog was terrible the the state of the Cuyahoga River the pollution you couldn't swim in really was recommended to stay away from the beaches in Cleveland and um, so I think we've come a long way but it certainly is a crisis now with uh, a sense of impending doom I think for our planet. I think you're talking about uh, back then, everybody was into performance cars at that time. That's when you had the Super B and you had a, a Dodge Charger and you had all of those and they used gas like it was just, um, <clears throat> I don't know, what, well no, water is, is pretty scarce uh, now. Um, and becoming more scarce, but it was like we thought that the spigot would never go dry. So 
Um, how do you think we've done about taking our dependency from coal and gas and oil and bringing in new technologies like solar and uh, wind and of course we all know that uh, people who do not uh, agree with solar and wind a lot of times it's the lithium uh, batteries that are needed uh, so I just wonder what you think how we're doing with that Drina um, have you kept up with that since that's one of the things you're talking about? Um, yeah, I would say I I haven't really kept up with it much at like a scientific uh, knowledge level, but um, in general, I think there have been great strides. And I did see a program this week about um, what airlines, what air, the air, um, the um, jet industry can do with um, not using uh, oil base for their fuels and that sounded very hopeful okay well that's that's very um, that's very helpful what you've said and I wanted to ask you one more thing oh the population growth um, I guess uh, it seems like we have, like in Sweden and in Europe and here in the United States, uh, that population, we've actually uh, kind of gone below what is needed to just replace who we had. And But in other parts of the world, it's exploded. And so how do you think that we... I mean, is it an ethical thing that we should put that on other parts of the world that mm. you need to keep your population at a certain level? Yeah. It's not it's not our place to say that, is it? Right. I, I understand what you're saying because I agree with you. Uh, mm. If anybody read Future Shop, that was one of the huge things they talked about was the population and how there would not be enough jobs, there would not be enough food, there would, you know, that we really needed to up our game in innovation and changing the way we did things. And I don't know how well we're doing with that. Uh, given the famines and the droughts and the things that we have going on. So just, you know, a little bit of that, and then we're going to move on to the next person. Yeah, I think it's uh, uh, a difficult problem. And, and also, if, you know, it, within countries that don't have, you know, enough, in a way, enough people to support the the uh, other generations, the older generations, it's going to be difficult to um, perhaps, you know, sustain our programs uh, uh, so, like, you know, Social Security. Um, but in a way it's an argument for immigration, you know, have people from other countries who want to, who want to come here. <laughs> That's a very interesting thought, and yeah, it does kind of help with uh, how we pay for Social Security. Um, let me see, who will I go to next? Uh, Becky, how would you like to uh, uh, give us a little bit about uh, when your first Earth Day was? Sure, can you hear me? Uh, very, very well. I've never done, I've never talked on these before. Um, I believe in the 70s, I remember when I was in grade school hearing that about Earth Day. And then, you know, growing up, you're young and you kind of don't pay attention, I guess. Mm -hmm. And as I became more aware of my natural surroundings, um, I kind of got involved in astronomy mm -hmm. and just learning things like, up lighting and how bad it is for nature mm -hmm. and then I think you start then you start hearing about recycling and I'm very aware of making sure I recycle the things I can and then aware about all the trees in my neighborhood how many are coming down just in my city 
where I live here in Northeast Ohio, and I'm getting more on uh, into these Zoom calls and be, becoming more aware of like the Nature Conservancy and and just more things. And my personal goal for myself is trying to see what small part can I do every year to make it a plus for Earth Day as opposed to a minus for Earth Day. Oh, so basically picking something each year that you're going to work on, like say recycling, and you're not only only going to recycle, but you're going to look at repurposing and reducing. And, um, you know, my big thing, I, and I don't know who's talking about it, somebody, oh, Snoop Dogg, is doing this thing with SodaStream now. And oh. with a uh, tortoise. And the tortoise is talking about how single-use plastic and um, those ring things are so awful for marine life and how you – so then Snoop Dogg talks about, well, if you get a soda stream and you make this soda, you know, water yourself or, or do this, then you could get a stainless steel or a reusable thing. And then there's this big pile of plastic, single-use plastic that the – tortoise pulls in and it's just like amazing you see how much so basically my daughter and I are going to see how much we can cut down our single use plastic this year and so that's one that that's our one thing to do so I really like that Becky it's it's like you know what is the one thing that you could decide to do for this year so that next year on Earth Day we could probably all get together and say, this is how well we did, this is how we did it, you know, and show other people. That's a great, great idea. I see if I'm running out of time, so i got to move on here. <laughs> okay, Sean. <laughs> I, I really like your ideas, though, and I'm so glad you uh, came with us, and I hope you stay so you can – uh, give us your other ideas because I think that is just a great one that you came up with for us. Thank so, you. Lord. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, Sean, how about if we hear from you and Earth Day? Sure. Uh, well, growing up, um, I I'd say I'm a little bit younger than everybody else. Um, growing up, and going through school, I remember school having a couple of things, especially in my early years uh, being in Berea City Schools so and the program that we were in. They they were definitely much more advanced than just a standard public school. So first through third grade, we always had some kind of project. I don't remember what we did, but it was it was good. Um, and then, as my dad had mentioned, you know, keeping chemicals from the house and things like that, uh, I can definitely attest to that. I have a very, very high sensitivity to chemicals, perfumes, scents. Anything I get has to be unscented. Uh, certain lotions irritate my skin. Um, the uh, laundry detergents, I can only use specific ones. Otherwise, my skin is really irritated from that as well. Uh, so I've developed very, very uh, high sensitivity to all the chemicals out there in the world. Uh, so I've continued that. I don't use chemically based anything anywhere that I can. Um, but the first actual, like, Earth Day, I, I can't really say that I've necessarily done a whole lot. Um, but recently... Uh, I got into photography and got out into nature a heck of a lot more than I ever have in my life. And that right there was pretty much the catalyst to get everything going. Um, definitely become much more of an activist for nature. Uh, I have a giant thing of woods behind my house, and I see all kinds of different critters. And I love each and every one of them. And, you know, just because I'm here doesn't mean that they should suffer. So definitely trying to put forth any effort that I can to get all of this stuff going. Um, been trying to get people to go with me on these bird walks that I do and, and take pictures and all that and just really enjoy nature and see what it's all about. Um, so Earth Day is going to be special from now on for me. 
Oh, that's really great to hear, Sean. And, you know, just like Becky, who's going to do one thing each year and try to put it into this is how I am, this is who I am, this is what I do, you uh, reaching out to other people and saying, I really enjoy this. Uh, why don't you come along and take a walk with me and, and, and see if you would enjoy it too. I think that's another way for all of us to be advocates of Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, birding, uh, reconnecting to nature, all of those things that we're trying to promote and preserve. Uh, it's, it's really a, a good, good way to go, Sean. Another, another very good uh, point that I think we've come up with. And um, Sean, or Bruce and Drina, you both, uh, from your perspective from the 70s until now, uh, just that chemical pollution that's still there. And in some ways, they're, we're doing better, but in another way, they're just labeling it differently. And Drina, yes, population is still a huge, I mean, we're at like, what, 9 billion people? And it doesn't seem like that's, uh, it's not going down the way uh, it was hoped. And uh, so, Patrick, I'm, I'm here to you. When was your first Earth Day, and, and what does it mean to you? Or is it just, uh, I don't know, your life is landscaping and native plants. I, I, I think you kind of live it every day. But uh, if you could just give us a few thoughts of what you think and how you feel. Patrick? Did we lose Patrick? No, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Hi, everybody. Um, I haven't been um, uh, with the group for a long time, so um, I, I mostly just kind of thought I'd sit in and, and say hello and get caught up a little bit. Oh, um, all right. But, but um, we're talking uh, about Earth Day today, so you get a chance to say a few words <laughs> I don't know that I ever really uh, I couldn't I couldn't look back and remember like uh, when I uh, you know celebrated Earth Day for the first time um, I don't I don't really know I don't really have an answer for that but um, I guess I can um, uh, you're right though uh, Gloria I I've always been since I was just a kid really um, just uh, the the uh, the natural world is just kind of everything to me, you know. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I've I've been uh, a bird watcher since uh, uh, since I was in high school. I started a my lifelong list in 1980, you know. And uh, um, I've been into that for a long time. And I just you know I've always hung out with people who go hiking. And I started. Uh, beekeeping about uh, over 20 years ago you know so I've been keeping honeybees for a long time and I've just been uh, that just became like a huge fascination for me and um, and continues to be and um, so I don't know I I I would have to say that I I see improvements um, there's still uh, room for much much more you know for sure um you know the honeybees alone are suffering because of uh problems with the environment and so are birds but we've seen uh some birds turn make these huge comebacks too like like you know we're all probably pretty familiar with the story of the bald eagle and when earth day started you know, 50 years ago, um, things were not looking good for the bald eagle, especially here in northeast Ohio and on the Cuyahoga River and stuff like that. And now there are bald eagles living right on the Cuyahoga River. They're living right in the city, you know. Yeah. And uh, the condition of the lake is, is better than it was, and the condition of the river is better than it was. Um, but, you know, we can't uh, – we can't uh, – 
uh, rest on our laurels, you know. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done, you know. And um, but uh, but this is um, it's been nice uh, listening to everybody's comments though, and good to see everybody. Yeah, it is. I think it is too. And I, um, you bring up again Bruce's uh, uh, his concern about chemicals, and you're right. DDT was banned. And immediately, uh, bald eagles were uh, better off, and that was what started their turnaround. Um, and uh, but there still are, uh, the, like you said, the bees. But we also have a lot of insects. I mean, um, don't want to rain on our parade of, yes, we've made success, but they're saying that we face an insect apocalypse uh, if we don't turn that around. And I think one of the big things is lightning bugs. Uh, you just don't see fireflies the way uh, we did in the past. And uh, I think that that kind of, to me, is one of the things that I think we need to kind of stress to our young youngsters when we uh, do our junior membership about uh, the the humming that you hear and the crickets and all of those night sounds that are kind of not, not as uh, prevalent as we once had. So thanks, Patrick, and I'm glad you're here tonight um, and you just want to see what's going on. That, that's good. And I had no idea you were a beekeeper, so I found something new and different about you. Betsy, I know I'm a little bit over time, but I kind of wanted to know what you uh, had to say about Earth Day and when your first Earth Day was. Can't hear you, sweetie. <laughs> Yes, it's 7:38, but um, and we are, but we did start a few minutes late. Um, so I'll quickly say something, and then maybe we'll hear from Amanda as well, and then we can move on to projects. Um, I don't really remember having like this sharp re memory about Earth Day. It was just always sort of there uh, and present. Um, but however, I think that it did. Um, um, make me, you know, more aware of, and help me to connect to a, a, a several different influences in my life when I was growing up. Um, and people, people who come to mind, uh, I had two parents who were both scientists um, in uh, botany, uh, geology, oceanography, and uh, nutritional sciences and chemistry. So it was a very science-oriented household. Um, and um, let's see, I had some amazing um, mentor teachers when I was um, in middle school and particularly in high school. Um, I had, of course, you couldn't do this now, but I had a biology teacher who was just, just amazing. He handed me a project book of lab experiments, which, and he would stay after school with me. He would correct papers and turn the lab over to me and this book. And I, I just did project after project after project. And then he would drive me home. <laughs> so <laughs> he, you never, you know, it was, uh, that's a sort of a historical story. <laughs> but, um, and because of that, um, I really pursued a strong interest in, in college uh, in science, um, in plant anatomy and different things. So. Um, yeah, and I was, I just remember I was always doing projects. Um, our household was just sort of like that, and my mom was a huge naturalist and canoeer, and we, she was a huge camper, which I was not crazy about, but, um, but re nonetheless, uh, we got to see all kinds of beautiful uh, natural landscapes where I grew up in New England. So, and we traveled nearly every state, and including the deep woods of Maine, the backwoods of Maine, uh, where I'm originally from. 
And uh, so anyway, so science, 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 uh, just always been been a pleasure and an unlimited sort of vortex of amazing discovery and information and always uh, cues my curiosity. Okay, well, thanks, Betsy. And Amanda, I ended with you because if I had had you before Betsy, she would have said, oh, well, we need to get going. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I'll, I'll just, that's okay, let's just go on. But I wanted to hear something from Betsy, too. So, Amanda, you're, you're last on the agenda here for what was your first Earth Day or what is your experience uh, with it? Or are you like Betsy and Patrick that, gee, it, it never really kind of entered in. And I think because of those two, I think they were just natural naturalists and it just was the way it, it happened. But how about you? Uh, well, let's see, can you hear me? Mm, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Um, well, I grew up on a farm, and my father was always teaching me about the importance of birds and resource usage. He didn't mean to. He just would talk about it. And my mother always uh, contributed to, like, fear for them, things like that. Then in high school, in the late 60s, my um, boyfriend, later to become my ex-husband, started a um, Theta Club because they didn't have uh, Earth Day yet. It was called Theta Club. It was, you know, an environment. And then once I went into college, uh, I was too busy to think about anything, but I always was resource conscious. I always conserved and, you know, it's just how I grew up. And then once I, you know, I've, I've been that way my whole life. And then when I retired, I was able to get into more um, uh, volunteering and trying to do a lot more on hands. And I always have publications out on my front uh, fence to try and teach people and things like that. So that's kind of my trajectory through life. Can't hear you. <laughs> You're muted, Gloria. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh -huh. So, uh, <clears throat> what you're saying is you have a, a bench or a, a something where you put out uh, publications or you uh, share it with people so they know what yeah. you're you're thinking and what you're doing. And I know that you have written right. some very, very good things for uh, Western Cuyahoga, and I'd love, I know you're busy, I know you're doing a lot of uh, your chimney swift work, and I know you're still uh, coming back from your shoulder energy and all of that, uh, but I, I love to see your writing, and uh, Bruce, you started writing, and anybody, Becky, if you would like to write a a story or a news blog or Patrick, I know this is your busy time of year, but it's a it's an added benefit that you get for being part of Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, I think, is with the articles, the uh, all of the things that we put out there that kind of help uh, citizen scientists and naturalists and people uh, keep up with what's happening and 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 what all of us are doing and what other people can do too. So uh, thanks, Amanda. That was a great way to end it. Okay, Betsy, uh, thank you. I think this was great for uh, uh, discussion. And I think when we get to junior membership, uh, I think that a lot of these things will stay with us uh, and we can kind of help us drive our conversation. So, Betsy, well, to you. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria, and thank you, everyone. So we'll move on now um, to uh, project reporting and connecting and stuff like that. Uh, before we do that, I just want to take a second to remind everyone that next Thursday, our second Guardians of Nature meeting for the month of April, we only have two, we have two per month. Um, we are 7 to 7.30 speaker and dialogue or discussion, 
is with uh, Daniel um, Brown, who is a founder of Rust Belt Writers. Um, and Daniel is doing some amazing work, uh, working locally uh, on compost. Composting, as their slogan is, um, feed people, not landfills. Uh, and so Daniel will have a lot of interesting things to talk to us about, about his business. He's also starting several um, sort of uh, um, uh, uh, sub-businesses out of Rust Belt Riders that involve, for example, one is called Till, and it's uh, the selling of soil. Uh, so if you can, do go to their website or when you get my next uh, newsletter, take a look and click through and um, come back and help us welcome Dan. Uh, these uh, discussions are meant to uh, energize us uh, and, and expand our knowledge and our awareness uh, and help us build our networks of like minds uh, so that we can be more powerful and more empowered to help the, the Earth. Okay, um, now I'm just going to tell you quickly, I have on the screen here, uh, can everyone see? Uh, just a moment, let me just check. Okay, let me reshare my screen. There we are. Um, and uh, so I want to start by, I just want to quickly mention one thing. Michelle Brocious, who's uh, the WCIS uh, field trip co-coordinator with Karu Tsuboni, um, Michelle, who could not be here this evening, uh, had um, asked everyone if two things. If this group and the people that you know or you could ask friends, uh, to come to the monthly online meetups. Uh, the virtual field trips are every, uh, a monthly. They identify a birding location. People go out and bird at their convenience and take pictures, uh, lots of different um, journaling or document, documenting media is, uh, is uh, welcomed things like poems or haikus or photography. And these are all collected, sent to Michelle, collected. And then Michelle curates all of the uh, bird lists and all of this material into a beautiful scrapbook, a digital scrapbook, uh, that then the group um, has the option of reporting out on during uh, the meetup. Meetups happen to, uh, the second Wednesday of the following month. Uh, but anyway, if you'd like more information about that, just go to the wcaudubon.org news. Go to the news blog there. Uh, so Michelle invites you. Everyone's welcome to attend those monthly meetups. They're pretty cool because you can find out a lot of information about places that you might know about or that you didn't know. Um, so they're, they're really interesting. And you also have the benefit of meeting all of these interesting birders and seeing the beautiful uh, journaling and bird lists and all kinds of things that, that people collect and document on their visits. The second thing is she asked if I would please uh, um, remind everyone um, that guardians, our guardians of nature, our network, we could be help uh, the virtual field trip endeavor by marketing uh, WCIS events on social media, whether it's a field trip or um, a Guardians of Nature meeting or something else. But generally, anything that's um, published to the news blog uh, is, uh, involves news and announcements. And those are wonderful things to share. Um, I did send a, a text out to Crew. She's not here quite yet. Um, and I haven't heard from her, so maybe something's come up for her. Um, but so let's move on uh, for the moment um, to the book club. And that is a conversation uh, with uh, Drina. And I believe uh, Gloria will pitch in as well. Okay, I can, I can start. And I just 
would like to start by saying thank you to Gloria and to Betsy for launching the uh, book club last September with some excellent programming and authors. And uh, since I retired last summer, um, I was able to then do this kind of activity, which I kind of always wanted to do, but really did not have the opportunity uh, while working. So um, they had set up a monthly schedule for an author, one on the third Sunday evening of the month, and then on the fourth Sunday evening of the month, there would be a book discussion. And those have been really wonderful opportunities. Last Sunday, we had uh, Katie Fallon uh, for the second time this season, and she did a wonderful presentation on Cerulean Warblers, and uh, the book was very interesting. Uh, I really enjoyed reading her book, and um, and it, uh, she had also done the program on vultures, and that was another good book. And actually, she helped to take me into, you know, kind of this new age of reading on uh, reading books electronically, which I had not really done before. So I feel like I've made a, a little uh, leap here. Um, so uh, the next step then is to continue the programming and to develop, uh, a, let's say, a season of presentations that will be attractive to people and that they'll be able to plan ahead for. I would ask any of you who know people uh, who are authors and would be agreeable to speaking and think it would be appropriate topics for that could have anything to do really with nature, but especially birds. Um, I come from the nursing world, and I know a lot about nursing. <laughs> I'm not uh, that up yet on um, the birding world and birding literature, but I'm finding out a lot. So uh, I have enjoyed it really, and um, I hope we will continue to have such good programming. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add, Gloria. Well, Darina, well, Darina, all I'd really like to say is if any of you have read a book by an author that you think would be really, really uh, interesting to others. Um, we have a uh, electronic book list that we're working on, and we're looking for uh, not only adult books, but young adult and children's books that uh, you you find that are really interesting and and worthwhile. Um, as well as others. And I just want to stress what um, Trina said is that we're looking for local authors or authors that are in the United States or even an international author that would be interesting, interested in um, speaking to us on a Sunday night, um, the third Sunday. Um, I can't remember, is that 7 or 7.30? 7, it is 7 it? o'clock. Seven, 7 to 8. So it's an hour-long program, and really uh, the book club, the book discussion, on this, which will be this Sunday, is also very, very interesting. And the people who come and, and share the latest book that they've read about birds or uh, nature, we really have good discussions, and uh, Drina is a great host, and she's doing a good job at asking uh, questions to draw people out and help them uh, share. So um, if you know anybody who is an um, avid reader, um, and maybe not into bird books, but I saw that Penny O'Connor uh, listed one about seagulls, uh, today, and it's historical fiction, and I, I just thought, hey, to me, that sounds like a great book to read, so that's going to be one that I'm going to look if the library has it and, and, and get it, and then I just saw one um, called 
bedside stories about birds. And I thought that sounded very interesting as well. Just, you know, pick up the book and read a, read a story a night. Um, so that's probably going to be another one I'll be sharing with everybody to let them know about. So um, I think Drina said it very, very well. And we do want to build this. And it's slow building. It's not a quick, quick thing. Um, but I think the more people talk about it, say, hey, you ought to, to look at it, you ought to join us. Um, and we still need to uh, figure out ticketing and, and how we should do that. And, you know, maybe there should be just join the book club and there's a one-time fee for a year or, or something. We need to still kind of, we're, we're finding our way on that. But uh, please, if you, if you love to read, uh, give us a try. Uh, Dreen and I will be there this Sunday. So uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to have you join us. Okay. All right. Let's see. Well, thank you. Uh, and if anyone has any book or author suggestions, as Gloria and Drina were saying, just uh, shoot uh, Drina or Gloria an email. Both of their addresses are shown on the screen. Um, and do try to come. Uh, they're really fun on the third and fourth Sundays of every month. All right. All right. Let's move on. Um, the next section is um, about fundraising. Uh, and I kind of gave this to Gloria, although everyone can pitch in. Uh, we're going to talk uh, briefly, uh, highlights and updates on four aspects of fundraising that uh, need to be addressed. One is the Junior Guardians of Nature membership program. That's one thing. Second one is the artwork donation pricing project That's uh, um, uh, that Sean Missig has donated. So. It'd be great if we had a couple of comments or feedback on pricing. This is to help help people work work projects out so that they can be stronger and be a success. Uh, third one is spring membership campaign, um, and the fourth one is I I added that one in is digital transformation fundraising campaign. I just think this is the big elephant in the room that we need to get uh, we need to address. So. Um, but let uh, Gloria uh, and anyone else, uh, please open your mics if you like, and um, let's start a conversation about fundraising. Um, Betsy, did you have uh, do you have a slide for the Junior Guardians of Nature yeah. membership program? Did I you know, see one? You know, I think I do. Um, let Let me just flip through the slide for a minute. Um, well, here, here is one. Is this what you had in mind? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the purpose of the junior membership was to continue uh, our community outreach uh, to you started with urban birding that uh, Betsy checked on earlier. Now, um, what we want to do is to extend membership to preteens and teenagers, and me, myself, and I I've kind of decided to try to do preteens and teenagers at the same time is a big uh, bite of the elephant to chew. So I believe this year that we should stick with trying to keep our middle school, middle schoolers uh, with things to do. And uh, from former teachers and teachers that I talk to, especially in the summer, they say that that's the group, the like third, the fourth graders to the eighth graders, like that. those four grades are the ones that are kind of like left to their own devices and could use something that had a little bit of a structure and would teach them something in a fun way and to do things. So I think that that's where we should start. And then we had a lot of objectives to create a backyard retreat and to explore the topography, to educate through story sharing. And uh, Becky, you might be interested in this. We had reuse, repurpose, reduce, and recycle as a last resort. So we were kind of talking about you, what you're doing and what you want to 
kind of work on this year. So basically, I think the main one should be to create a backyard retreat and use our programming to do that. But in so doing, uh, right off the top of my head, a single-use plastic bottle can become a bird feeder. And so we could show them how to reuse and repurpose that plastic bottle into a bird feeder very easily. It's a very easy thing for kids to do. So those kinds of things is what we want to do with our programming. And um, but we're also going to offer a junior membership at $20 a year for uh, kids. So um, is there another one about that as well? Maybe I can very quickly. take a look at the next slide. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at Backyard Retreat, we have a whole thing of Food, shelter, cover, raising young, water, uh, soil, types of plants. We could take in our native plant, uh, plant sales and kind of push that out. And Bruce, uh, you and I talked a year ago uh, when we both applied for that Sierra uh, Club native plant garden that we didn't get, either one of us. But I'm thinking that you had wanted to add native plants to your garden, and I thought, and I'm doing that too this year. So I thought we could use that, our gardens, as a learning demonstration way of how to plant a native plant, how to do seed bombs, and how to do those things. So that's kind of what our uh, programming will be. And that will be in addition to the junior membership, which is $20. Uh, we've talked about whether that is going to be ticketed, which we are going to have to have some kind of ticketing or sponsorship to defray the cost of putting that uh, programming into our archive and to do the marketing that we need to do. So. Uh, Right now, I think that's an update on the Junior Guardian membership, and um, I guess we're going back to what uh, the next one is, which is, uh, Sean, do you want to talk about your artwork donation project? Sure. Uh, I, I think where I'm at with it now, I do have everything printed. Um, they are here at my house. They, they look wonderful. I have a friend who works at a local company called Alpha Graphics out of Westlake, and uh, he, he handled all of the printing for us, so everything came out really, really well. Um, so pricing is really just the only issue that I have kind of uh, looming over this project. Uh, I did did try to ask my friends through Facebook, and of course, not a whole lot of people answered. Uh, but I did ask some other coworkers for input in terms of, you know, what price would be good for them, what what would they want to see, uh, and if they would be more inclined to say pay a higher price um, if they knew that it was uh, for a donation to the Western Cuyahoga Autobahn, uh, rather than it just being, hey, you're paying this much to get my piece of artwork that I created. Um, it, the majority me. of people... Yeah, excuse yeah. me, Sean. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And could you also give people, and I uh, just tell people what your project is? Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll try and find an example on my computer while you're talking so we can show people. Uh, Actually, yeah, uh, give me a minute because okay. I can go grab them and I can share my screen. Oh, all right. Uh, or, or at least, or at least, or, well, no, sharing my screen won't work, but I can at least turn on my camera and hold the things in front of the camera. Oh, that would work. Okay. All right. Uh, 
Okay, can there you see you me? Are. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, is this in frame? Uh, sort of. <laughs> yeah. That's a little I, better. I have no way of monitoring. That's okay. That's good. There we go. Okay, I can see myself so now. Can, can so can can you tell us what this is, how many there are, um, and uh, back out just a little bit so we can see um, the poetry on the bottom and there give dimensions and stuff like that. So we need help okay. on figuring out pricing. These will be placed so at are, the WC Audubon store. Excuse me. Yeah, these these are all printed on eight and a half by eleven sheets of uh, cardstock, so it's a little bit thicker than a standard sheet of paper. Uh, there's five different designs. This one is the design from the actual field trip that I wrote the poem for. So up top, you can see there's going to be a photo. Below that, then, is the poem that I wrote uh, inspired by that trip to the uh, Ohio and Erie Canal Park there uh, on East 49th. So each one of these does have the same poem, um, but then I just changed up the picture. So this is a robin for springtime. I then have a yellow swallowtail for summer. Found this bench at uh, Rocky River Reservation for fall. And then this is French Creek Park for winter. There are a total of 250 of these. So I have uh, 50 of each that are available. And I guess I, I put together two different pricing schemes. And that's, that's kind of where I'm sitting. One's a little bit lower uh, to kind of be tantalizing to anybody, really. And then the other one's a little bit higher with uh, higher donations in mind. T tell us what those levels are, please. Uh, sure. Let me pull up that email because I forgot off the top of my head. And then maybe this group can noodle it around in your mind and see if you have any off the top of your head feedback or reactions. Okay, so... So the, the cheaper of the two scenarios with the idea of um, getting more people involved would be you get a single choice of uh, any of the designs for a $20 donation. For $30, you would get two designs. $50, you get three. $60, you get four. And you could get all five of the designs for $80. The other pricing scenario that I came up with, which was the higher tier, so more focused on bringing more money in, would be you get the single shot for 50, you can get two for 75, three for 100, four for 125, and if you wanted to get all five designs, then it would be 150. All of these would be unframed, and just as you saw them, uh, I do have envelopes to deliver them, um, and of course we could obviously mail them. I know mm -hmm. once this goes live, I have uh, friends in Pennsylvania that will more than likely jump on this. I also have friends in Michigan that will likely be jumping on this as well, so I'll definitely have a lot to mail out. Um, but that, that's kind of where I'm at is with the pricing. Like I said, I have everything here. It's all printed, ready to go. Well, that's a wonderful project, and, and that's an out, outgrowth of uh, the virtual field trips, which I think is totally cool and very generous uh, donation on your part. Time um, and labor and creative power. Well, I, okay. I had to give back because, honestly, the virtual field trips have been a huge, huge impact on my life since I started doing them. Um, oh, nice. And oh. It's, it's great. So w without That's them good. and without getting out there into nature, I wouldn't mm -hmm. be where I'm at today. So no. uh, I'm definitely going to be giving back as much as I can. Oh, well, that's, that's really nice. good. Very nice. Um, 
Off the top of my head, I like the first pricing better, I believe. I think uh, you're right, Sean. I think we'll get a bigger audience. Uh, we can kind of grow it. I can see that, you know, you've already uh, figured out that you're going to have some sales, but I also could see uh, people wanting to give them as gifts. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking Mother's Day and Father's Day, if we could get them up at the store that quickly, we could start kind of promoting that that's something that you could buy from WCAS for a, and, you know, uh, an unframed print for $20 is not, uh, uh, that's not unreasonable, I don't believe. And those, I, I love the French Creek one and the Rocky River one. Those are my two. Those would be the two. In fact, probably will be the two that I purchase, but, uh, and I'll probably keep one for myself and, and give one to a friend, but, uh, and that's because of the poem. I, you know, I think that I'd want to put the poem one place in, in my house and not have it two places. That's just me. But I'd like to know what other people uh, think as far as pricing or or whatever. Uh, Becky, you're new, but I would like you just to hop right in here and maybe go at top of mind what you think uh, of, of the idea of, first of all, trying to get them out there for Mother's Day and Father's Day, and um, how, how's your thoughts about pricing? Do you think we're we're in kind of in the ballpark, or or what are we doing? And I think we all need to remember, like Sean said, this isn't uh, it's a donation to WCAS as well as the his photography. So uh, right. well, to be honest, I've never really been involved in any kind of fundraising I've always just volunteered my time and I'm not uh, just my own personal thing I think the pricing is fine um, it's not anything I would get because I usually just like to I would like to me I'm retired I, I can't afford the higher pricing but I usually don't put things on my walls you're gonna laugh and it's just not my my thing but um price wise it seems okay for the for the lower one for people who could you know can afford it and like stuff on their walls okay that probably sounds kind of weird but i you know i'm just being honest no, no. It doesn't, you don't sound weird at all that's exactly no. what we're looking for is um just help thinking and figuring stuff out and yeah. okay. and becky that's that's where we all can come from mm -hmm. is our own experience and yeah. what we would do and what we were, you know, and, it, you know, I mean, you were just saying like it is, it's, I don't put things on my walls. So no, it's not something I would buy, but for someone who would, I think the price is okay. That's, that's yeah. it. That's yeah, that great. Probably it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, just great. Thank you. And thank sure. you. I, I don't like to put people on the spot, but I also like to get people who are new to our group involved in what we're doing. Amanda, are you still here? Amanda, leave. No, she's no, here. Amanda's here. No, I hear her. Um, I, I agree. I think that the lower prices will get more people involved. Um, and, I, and I agree, too. I don't get stuff anymore because I'm trying to be junk, so mm -hmm. I don't buy stuff. but. Um, if I would, it's, I think it's a good price range, the lower prices. And I think they're beautiful. <laughs> I really <Yeah>. like them. <laughs> mute. I, You're muted, Gloria. You. Uh, I see I am. I think Becky <laughs> and Amanda have both told us something very important. Um, People of a certain age are looking to downsize and aren't 
buying things. So we need to realize this is a, a group that we need to kind of make it uh, Sean's age in, in that group and maybe Michelle and Carew and, and, and that we, we've got to do our marketing uh, based on that. Thank Although you. I want to add too, though, that um, uh, the you know one or a couple or the set would make a lovely gift. Yes. And especially right. to actually to right. even to another birder, and especially if they know the place. Yes. So yes. I don't know. So those are some other things I'm thinking about too. But those are all things that we need to remember when we're marketing this. Is right the places, people are going to know the places, uh, birders, yeah, we've got, and mothers and fathers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it might be a good, a good uh, addition to what uh, people can do. So, uh, Drina. I would say that uh, the pricing of, of the lower pricing with starting at $20 is more attractive. And um, I can see it definitely as a gift for, uh, for people who are nature lovers. And uh, again, that idea of two of this local, local um, people um, who would recognize the area. Well, there you go, Sean. Yeah. Oh, well, Bruce. We didn't ask Bruce. What's Dad say? Where is Dad? <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't my turn to watch him. <laughs> I get all mine free. Oh, <laughs> Gloria, you're muted. I didn't print any extras. Oh, uh-oh. <laughs> I thought maybe we lost you to PBS. I, I'm sorry. I <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, Sean, there you have it. I think that – did that help you? Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, I had a few people who said that they would pay the higher price uh, because they know that it's going to – the Autobahn rather than mm -hmm. they're just paying for um, for my piece of art. But at the same time, that might it, make them more inclined to buy more of them, mm -hmm. more of the prints then. So, right. you know, I don't, I don't mind putting it at low uh, regardless, you know, this is all going to the Autobahn. So it's, it's going to be great. Um, and I do want to say that if this is a success, I have no problem printing more. I have no problem changing up the design. Um, and I've also probably later this year provided that these sell well. I want to work with uh, Tom Fishburne, and I want to get some of him is, his images if he wants to join up with this and put him uh, his images on there rather than mine uh, and really just try and make this a very collaborative effort because um, he, he's definitely somebody who has influenced me since I started doing the virtual field trips and uh, – just an all-around great guy to take some great photos. Yeah. So to spotlight that as well would be great, too. So lots Sean, of things in the future if this goes well. Good. Sean, yeah. I, I truly believe Tom will be on board with this and willing to collaborate with you because he has offered some of his photographs, uh, I believe, uh, framed, but his feeling is that people don't, like framed photos anymore so I think that uh, with an added poem or haiku or something with his I'm sure he would be on this with you that he would be glad to collaborate with you so I would say yeah uh, he'd be one that yeah. would be great so I'm glad to hear that you thought of Tom good Good. Okay, let's let's move on. It's eight twenty. I'd like to finish by eight thirty. Yeah, um, I think we can. Good. Uh, spring membership campaign. Uh, this was brought up recently uh, in an effort to attract 
new members, primarily uh, to Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, always working to uh, uh, grow membership um, and um, get the word out and promote the Audubon mission. Um, we were thinking, I'm sorry, I don't have, well, we were thinking of starting it May, um, from May 1st through to the, tw the 20th? June 20th, uh, right. because right after Father's Day. We thought yeah. we would get those two uh, mm -hmm. holidays in there so that sons and daughters, nieces, nephews could maybe give a prem uh a membership to their birding uncle or birding aunt or their mother or father, you know, someone that looks out the window and has their book by the, you know, but never really got involved in uh, something like WCAS. And I think with our virtual programming, there are a lot of things that uh, older people like myself and others uh, would enjoy uh, doing and talking to people. So um, I don't think uh, even when we go back to our new normal with uh, when we're out and about, I, I do believe that virtual things will stay in everybody's uh, way they stay in contact with people. So uh, I think it's just a good time that we could push this uh, and um, Betsy, do you want to talk about the incentives? Do you remember what we said about like having a drawing um, for people that if you if they got the membership, then they are placed in a drawing that they get uh, maybe a, a pound of birds and beans coffee could be one uh, thing. Uh, two ice cream gift mm -hmm. cards from Mitchell's, and I can't remember, oh, uh, year's subscription. We were going to ask Wendy Clark about a uh, year's subscription to uh, Bird Watchers Digest. And do you think that that would be an added uh, kind of incentive for somebody to uh, buy that for someone so that they'd also have the chance uh, to win something as well. I just wonder what everybody thinks about that. Well, don't all speak up at once. <laughs> Nobody has any idea. Drina, I got to call on you. Please forgive me. I wasn't listening. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> my, my question was if we gave incentives, and Bruce, I, I don't, I want to mention this too. Bruce said if they, if they buy a membership in, May or June, they're going to have three months free. They're actually going to have a, a 16 month uh, membership to uh, WCS for this year. Next year, they would be in the pool with everybody that renews in August or September, but this year they would get an additional four months. So he thought that might be an, an added incentive to buy it now and uh, to do that. So you get 16 months for uh, a 12-month subscript uh, membership. I but think that's other, a great idea. Okay, so that's a good yeah, promotion. But then the other thing was that if someone bought a membership for somebody, the person who gets the membership would also be placed in a drawing to maybe win a year subscription to Bird Watchers Digest, uh, or something, or, or something perhaps, because they or already like that. 
they already offer a free one-year uh, subscription to Bird Watchers Digest for the uh, photography photograph of the month. Oh, that's true. But right, maybe so. something else, if they had another promotion they could do, or um, I don't know, we don't have many books uh, left, the Urban Birder book. Uh, um, does, does anyone here have ideas for other incentives? Yeah, like, that might be um, a good idea. Um, for like local companies? Amanda, do you have any ideas? Um, something that would be like Amanda do you have any ideas something that would be fun to get or that you would like to get if if you signed if you um, uh, purchased a spring membership and 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 again we're I'm hoping that we can attract new new memberships as well any ideas anybody uh, bird seed everybody likes okay. to get bird seed <laughs> Thank you. All right. Ooh, well, that's that, a good one. All right. That's good. What else? Any other ideas? What would you like to get that would be fun and, oh, good, I got that? Hmm. Sean? Well, we can, there, was, there was discussion uh, on Monday night, wasn't there, about uh, using the windows? stickers that would um, oh right the window clings window clings oh so people don't so birds don't fly into your windows oh oh no the um, brand the 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 seal of Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society the window cling that you can put on your car or your window we it just had get... some we just had a birder right from Spain who asked for one so that he could put it on his car. <laughs> now, David Lindo has our window cling on his car. Maybe they know oh. each other. <laughs> oh. Hey, uh, don't we get that with a membership? You do. Yeah. So that comes with a membership. Um, anybody else? Any other nice things or things that you might have seen? I like that idea of bird seed. What about the rock, something from the rock pile or something? That's an idea. Yeah. All right. Okay. Those are some good things. Yeah. Great. I All also right. think we should think of a few things for uh, the, at the same time, we want to uh, launch the junior membership uh, as like, uh, you know, Buy a spring membership for your aunt or uncle and maybe a, a, a young nephew or niece or something that or the aunt and uncle can buy the uh, membership and include their uh, nieces and nephews or grandkids. So uh, we were thinking of that as well. So we're going to try I've... to do a bundle. I, I wonder if we could offer one of Sean's uh, pieces of artwork. Oh, well, that would be up to Sean. I, I'd that would be perfectly fine with that. Thank that would you. be a nice uh, gift. I mean, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, they. I mean, you know, they, I, I've donated them to, to the Audubon Society, essentially. I mean, even though right. I still have them here, but... Uh, they are essentially property of the Audubon Society at this point. So if you guys want to offer it up, you know, then that's that's no problem for me. I'm okay uh, thank with you. that. Uh, thank you, I Sean. I need to know where they get to go. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Um, folks, it's 829. We have two items left, but I'm going to suggest that we continue next week uh, in our project session uh, with those. Uh, yeah. The Digital Transformation Fundraising Campaign and the Guardians of Nature Mission and Vision. I'll try and get um, the uh, recording of our meeting to you uh, very soon in a follow-up email. Uh, before we close, is there anyone here who would like to add anything to our conversation um, or suggest a speaker or any other thing? Well, real quick, I don't know how you do your fundraising like for the uh, Guardians. Um, yes. But I know a lot of kids and their parents go to, like, I'm just talking about my, my local library, Willoughby sure. Library, and um, 
A lot of times they, they okay things to put on their bulletin board. That's free advertisement right there. And it and it targets kids too, you know. I mean parents could look are always looking for things for their kids to do. That is so true. And and I just read that uh, the old Cuyahoga library system is gonna be receiving sixty million dollar investment or something. Quite a quite a um which is wonderful. So yeah. uh, the libraries uh, have a good future, uh, and, good. Yeah. and they're amazing resources for us all. We're so lucky here in our region for, yeah. Uh, yeah. for the library system that we have. Yeah. Well, I think Becky's right, though. I think it's a great way where we could put up a flyer on their bulletin board or something and maybe get on, you know, a lot of the libraries have uh, digital uh, electronic uh, things of things to do, too. So it would be a great place to advertise the junior uh, guardians. Um, Very good. Very good. All right. Well, thanks, folks. Thank you for everyone who came, attended tonight. Thanks for all your ideas and brain power. And mm -hmm. uh, I hope that we see you next Thursday. Uh, be sure to try to come and try to bring a friend. Um, Dan Brown from Rust Belt Writers is going to be very interesting. And we'll continue our conversation about the projects um, and so that we can move along and make progress. All right. Okay. Happy Earth Day. Thank you, Gloria. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I enjoyed myself. It was great to hear everybody's thoughts about uh, Earth Day. And, yeah, I think uh, we all need to learn more about composting and what we can do and, and help the soil. So uh, I think it's a... I'm going to be there uh, next Thursday. So see Very you all good. next Thursday, I hope. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.